Hey, hi, I'm David Wong, and this is a TLDR of this paper on the practical insecurity of 64 bit block ciphers. It was released uh, August 24th of 2016 by two guys from the INRIA. Uh, INRIA are the French, uh, the French people, you know, who find a lot of TLS attacks like Freak, uh, Logjam, Drown, uh, etc. And so and so this is an interesting paper, another one of these, uh, of these attacks on TLS. And mostly this video is a short video to explain to you most of the important points of the paper. If you're too lazy to read it or too scared or you don't know if you're interested in this kind of attack, so, so this video is made for you. So let's dig right in, okay? But I'm gonna start very easily and it's going to be very short, bear with me, but what is a mode of operation? So imagine here on top you have this, this long plain text, and here in the middle you have this smaller cipher with a block size which is smaller than your plain text that you want to encrypt. Okay, so imagine that here the cipher, the, the box, is a 64-bit cipher, like Blowfish, Des, uh, Free Des, something like that. And so you can only encrypt a plain text of 64 bits. If your plain text, plain text is smaller than 64 bits, usually you pad it with some padding by adding bytes or bits at the end uh, until you have a 64 bit uh, plain text and then you can encrypt it. But what happens when you have a bigger plain text? Well, if you have a bigger plain text, then you need a cipher mode. Or a mode of operation. So the most naive way to do that is to use ECB. It's the, the, the most simple mode of encryption, mode of operation that you can imagine. And here you split your plain text and imagine that your plain text is a multiple of 64 bits here. And that is if it's not a multiple of 64 bits, you pad it. So here we have three times 64 bits plain text and we split it in three and we give all these three 64 bit blocks to our encryption uh, so maybe three less and we encrypt them separately with the same key to get three separate cipher texts and we can stitch them back together to get the full cipher text so this is uh, if you know a bit about cipher modes cipher modes you know that ECB is very bad because if you encrypt the same thing twice you will get the same encryption twice and this is just bad. So usually you want something more robust, more solid, and you will use something, for example, like CBC. And CBC, this is CBC, uh, must have been the most famous or maybe the most used uh, mode of operation in the last decade, uh, if not more. And it probably is, is more. So how does CBC works? Well, here we split our plain text in three parts, right? And on the left side, you have an IV, an initialization vector. What is it? It's some, it's some random block, so 64 bits, that you need to generate randomly every time you want to encrypt some plain text, some message. And it's kind, of, it's kind of annoying because every time you want to encrypt a new message, you have to generate some new randomness. But this is, this is how things are. This is how CBC works. And and if it's not truly random, if it's not, if you can predict it, then you have attacks. For example, look at the beast attack. Uh, the beast attack was based on, on, was attacking TLS with CBC mods when you could predict the IV. And I, I won't talk about it more here, but, but if you're interested, you can look into it. So IV is random, and you XOR that with the plain text, and you encrypt this thing, this value, and it gives you the ciphertext. Okay, the first block of ciphertext. And then to encrypt the, the second block of plain text, you don't, you don't XOR it with an IV, but this time you XOR it with the previous ciphertext. And then you encrypt that and it gives you the, same, the other block of ciphertext. This way, if you encrypt uh, the second block of plain text, which is the same one as the first block of plain text, you won't have the same thing. Uh, I hope this is clear. So, the paper is an attack on 64-bit block ciphers, but it's also an attack on CBC. So you have to understand CBC. And if you don't uh, really understand this figure uh, right now, then you can pause the video to, to take more time to understand it. 
All right. So now I'm going to I'm going to assume that you understand how CBC works and you really understand this diagram and this is important for the rest of the attack. And now let's imagine that you're observing connections being made from uh, a client, but let's call him the victim because you want to steal something from the victim from this client. And this victim is making a lot of connections on TLS connections on some websites. Uh, for, for example, let's imagine that he's connecting to bank.com. Here you observe ciphertext. Uh, he's connecting to bank.com through TLS, so you can only observe the encrypted data. But let's imagine that you know that first block of plain text. Okay, this is one message that you observe. You observe the ciphertext, but you know the first block of plain text. How is that? Well, let's imagine that you know that because uh, you might have uh, you might have used Burp before. Burp is this program to intercept uh, queries being made on a website, and if you have used that, you you must have seen how HTTP behaves. So when you do HTTP requests, usually it works kind of the same. You do these gates requests, and then you have a space, a slash, a space, HTTP, slash 1.1, or the other version, uh, and then the host, etc. Usually you can predict most of what a query looks like. This is half because a website is public, and half because uh, everybody used the same uh, way of querying a website, HTTP 1.1 or some sometimes 2.0, uh, but but you can predict all of that, except some some parts. But we'll say that at least for this first block of plain text, for the first 64 bits, you can predict them. Okay, that's that's an okay. Um, I'm not asking for too much, and we're just now the first block of plain text. And now uh, we know the IV also because, uh, and here I call it IV1, it's a blue IV. We know it because the IV is public. You need to send it next to your ciphertext. And, and, and you know the ciphertext because you can observe that encrypted data. And without the IV, the other end, so bank.com cannot decrypt the ciphertext. Okay, so that's why you need to send the IV. Of course, you need to authenticate, you need to make sure of the integrity of the ciphertext on the IV so that attackers in the middle, for example us here, wouldn't be able to modify either the ciphertext or the IV. So you need to authenticate them with a MAC uh, message authentication code. But I won't talk about authenticated encryption here and uh, this is not important or relevant for the attack. Uh, but if you would do authenticated encryption, you would have to authenticate the IV as well as the ciphertext. It's a, it's a common pitfall, it's a common mistake that people do. All right. We have this first message, we, we observe the ciphertext, the IV, and here we know the plaintext. So we kind of know everything, right? And I'm going to blur uh, the, the right side of this uh, CBC mode because we don't care about what comes after. And now imagine that we observe a lot of messages. And then one, one message come, and, and this is here the second line, we observe a new ciphertext, still from the victim to the bank. and. The plain text here, the first block of plain text, we don't know. And let's imagine that it's something we want to know. It's not some random data that we don't care. It's something we, we really want to steal uh, from the victim when it connects to, to bank.com and it's sending this thing, okay? And to make the attack easier, we can imagine that this, the victim is uh, sending that very often, something that we want to know very often. And what is it? Well, the, the first thing, that should have come to your mind is a session ID. Usually one way of making a session, so session is, is some way for the server to recognize you, okay? When you go to bank.com or facebook.com or whatever website you can imagine, you don't log in on the website at every page, right? You log in once and then you can visit the website for I don't know how many hours after that. It's because you have a cookie that you send on every request that contains a session ID and it's, it's usually a random number it could be something else depends how you construct it and that way the server can recognize you and doesn't have to ask you to re-log in on every page okay so this session ID is always the same or usually it's always the same it's not renewed at every request and it's sent at every request um, that the client makes so this is something that you could steal 
And if you steal it, you can impersonate the client. So if you steal, I don't know, Gmail, a Gmail session ID, you can impersonate the client and just look at the emails of the client. You don't steal the passwords, but you, you impersonate the client to the server. All right, enough blah, blah. Uh, so now here you know the plain text uh, of the first message up there. And the second message that you observe, you don't know the plain text, uh, but you want to know it. And of course you observe the IV, IV2, and you observe the ciphertext, ciphertext one. And here you can observe the mistake or you can observe something weird. We have the same ciphertext as the previous message. And this is what I want you to observe. This is not a mistake I just made. This is something you, you observe after I don't know how many messages, you observe the same ciphertext. Okay? So I'll recapitulate. You observe the first message and you know everything on that first message, the plain text being encrypted, the IV and the ciphertext. And you observe after several messages, a second message where you want to know the plain text. And you also realize that the ciphertext is the same as your previous message. So can you see what is wrong here? And at this point, you should pause the video if you don't see what is wrong. And imagine what you can do when, the ci when you have a collision on the ciphertext. Okay, ciphertext one, ciphertext one, it's the same red ciphertext uh, for the two messages. <coughs> so I imagine that you've noticed uh, what is wrong or that you're still wondering and you cannot find what is wrong. Well, here what is encrypted to give us this, cy this red ciphertext. On the second line, we cannot really know. It's the IV XORed with some plain text that we want to know. But on the first line, we know, right? It's this orange plain text one XORed with this blue IV one. And so that's what we have on the second line here. We know what is being encrypted to give that ciphertext. So we can remove that encryption part, and we know that the plain text that we want to know, XORed with the IV number two, is equal to uh, this value that we know. And so if you know how XOR works, you can XOR everything together and you get the plain text back. And that's the basis of the attack. I spent uh, 12 minutes on this. And if you understand this, you understand the attack. Basically, you want to wait and observe many, many requests. And as soon as you have a collision between two ciphertext blocks, where you know one of the encryption of one, but you want to know the encryption of the other, then it's a win. Then you can decrypt that block. All right? So if you understand that, you understand the attack. And this thing does, doesn't only work on the first block. It can work on any collision anywhere. And I'll show you how. Uh, so here, imagine that the collision occurs on the third block uh, in the single message. And on the first block, I kept the first block, but it could be anywhere else on the first message, on the first line. So here is the same thing. And if you don't know, pause the video, okay? But I, I'll, I'll just assume that, that you, you figured out um, what's going wrong, what is wrong. And here you know this value, right? Exactly the same as the previous slides. And so you can recover that plain text here that you don't know by extracting everything out. But here is not the IV. IV number two that you XOR out with the, this value, it's the ciphertext number two. It's the previous uh, ciphertext uh, in the CBC uh, chain. Okay? So, right now, if you understand all of this, you should understand the attack. And let me explain a bit more about the attack. Okay, so you understand the theory of what happens when you have collisions of certain blocks, but how do you trigger such an attack? You need a lot of queries to do that, so you cannot just wait and observe the, the, the victim doing a lot of queries on some, some banking website. It won't work like that because you need a huge amount of queries, so you need to trigger this attack. One way of triggering it, or I'll tell you two ways of doing it, and these two ways are called beast style attacks, or beast style uh, methods and this is I think because beast uh, the beast attack was the first one to kind of use uh, these kind of triggers these methods on to attack TLS uh, and so we'll see the first one okay so imagine that you fish the victim and you send him an email send her an email uh, with your evil website your malicious website the victim visits 
this website and there is some JavaScript on there that makes the victim do a lot of requests over TLS to some bank.com. And for some reason, you can also man in the middle the client, the victim, uh, between, you're, you're in the middle between the client and the bank. So you can observe all these TLS connections being made, TLS messages being sent, sorry. And there are a lot of them because, because of your JavaScript on evil.com. Make sense? The other attack that you can do is more efficient because you don't have to wait until the victim clicks on your link or visit your evil website. You can just completely man in the middle of the client, the victim, and as soon as the victim does a uh, unsecure request over the, any server, any website, so an HTTP request over any website, you can inject some JavaScript in there that will make the client do a lot of requests over bank.com. And since you're already man in the middle in the client, you can see all those requests being made over bank.com. All right, uh, so now you know how that attack can be triggered. Uh, let's go back to how we can do the attack. So remember, we're hoping to see a collision between two ciphertext block, so 64-bit blocks, if we're using a 64-bit ciphers. And this doesn't happen a lot. It's not something that you're going to observe very often. Uh, and if you know your math, you know that for 64-bit blocks to repeat itself, well, you have a lot of possibilities. You have 2 to the 64 possibilities. So you can imagine that uh, going through the whole space of the 2 to the 64-bit possibilities of a block, uh, block of ciphertext is going to take you a long time. But fortunately for us, a cipher has some properties that it's indistinguishable from random. And so that means that ciphertext will kind of come at random. And so that means that you have something interesting that is called the birthday paradox that tells you that you won't have to wait 2 to the 64 to observe 2 to the 64 blocks of ciphertext before observing collision, but rather you will observe a collision uh, after the square root of this. Uh, and, and I won't give you the exact formula. There is a very nice uh, Dan Bonnet video um, uh, telling you about this birthday paradox, and I'll link uh, to it in the comments in the description of the video. Uh, but but basically tells you that after approximately two to the thirty-two blocks of ciphertext, you will start observing with fifty percent chance collisions in those blocks of ciphertext. Okay, so basically you have to wait 2 to the 32 uh, blocks of ciphertext. And we can call that the birthday bound also. And it's more complicated, complicated than that for our attack because we don't want any collision. We want a collision between something, uh, between something that, is, uh, that we know, uh, we know the encryption of, and the collision, the other part of the collision must be something that we want to know the encryption of. Okay, so not any collision. So that makes the attack a bit more complicated, but not that much more. And you only need a f uh, like 30, 40 gigabytes uh, of data to observe, uh, to, to, to see, to have enough to break at least two blocks uh, of unknown ciphertext. And if you read the paper, you have those, uh, those numbers, uh, they did the attack. It took them uh, quite some time, so I think 40 hours or something like that for, um, for TLS when they used Freedes. And they did the same attack on OpenVPN. And OpenVPN, I think, used Blowfish, so it's much faster. And, and so you can imagine that if you use a much faster cipher, the queries will go faster and you can, you can do the attack faster. Uh, but yeah, I won't talk about that here. You can read the paper if you want the numbers. Uh, but know that it's more complicated than just the birthday bound because you need uh, good collisions and not any collisions. Uh, and this attack works on 64-bit ciphers because of that birthday paradox as well. If you look at 128-bit ciphers, you won't have uh, you will have to wait much longer, and and it's it's quite impossible. Another way, another thing I want to talk about is that. Uh, so if you look at the paper again, you will see that they have this table of the top 10 websites on Alexa and how they behave when you try to connect to them for a long period of time. And you will see that a lot of them 
limit the time you can connect to them. So, for example, if you take Facebook, I think they don't limit at all. You can connect to Facebook and they will keep the session alive for the rest of your life. But if you go to Baidu.com, they will cut the connection after 30 minutes or something. And this is very variable and it's very hard to predict. So every server has to be checked uh, independently. So the problem here is that if the connection only lasts 30 minutes and the attack is supposed to last hours, then you cannot do anything because because the key will change when you try to reconnect after 30 minutes and this attack needs the same key, right? It's a, it's a unique key attack. Another thing that happens, and it's not limiting the connection in time, but limiting the connection in number of queries, and this is called rekeying, is that most implementations will rekey, renegotiate, renegotiate key, uh, the session keys used to encrypt with uh, your 64-bit block cipher after a certain number of messages being encrypted. The good news is that this rekeying happens not often enough to block our attack. If it happens before we can observe the good collisions, then it's okay, we'll, we'll try again uh, from scratch and probabilities will help us and, and probably will the attack will work. And, and even better, we don't need that many queries. Remember the attack works by observing blocks of ciphertext, not queries. So if you can make your queries bigger, you can observe more blocks of ciphertext and you don't need to send that many queries. And that's what they do in the paper. They inflate, inflate the, the, the queries being made by the victim by just appending random string at the end, but they know the strings, right? They need to know what is being encrypted. And like that, you, the, the victim does uh, these huge queries that allow them to observe more block of ciphertext per queries. And so because of that, you don't need that many queries and you can circumvent this rekeying uh, that happens. So this is the end of this video. I don't have uh, much more to say about this paper. Uh, of course, the, the paper talks a bit more uh, about uh, a bunch of stuff that I'm ignoring or not really talking about in this video. So uh, read the paper if you're really interested and, and you want to know more about it. Uh, but I think that's uh, that's enough. That's 22 minutes now for for a TLDR video, and I will leave you at that. If you have any questions, feel free to comment in the comment sections.